Like most other systems that are managed via a web browser, PFSense is supplied with a self-signed certificate. Now, aside from that warning from your web browser being annoying, it's actually there for a very good reason. And as a good security practice, you should be replacing self-signed certificates with trusted certificates as soon as possible. But how do you actually create a certificate signing request on PFSense? And how do you then install a certificate? Well, if that's something you're interested in finding out, then stick around and watch this video, because that's what we'll be going over. Now, it's going to make no difference whether you're going to be using a server that's public facing or internal facing. If you want a certificate that's going to be trusted by web browsers, you need to have an actual certificate that's signed by a certificate authority. To actually obtain one of those, you have to create a certificate signing request. So in the case of PFSense, we've logged in and we're on our dashboard. So I'm going to click on System. Then I'm going to click on Certificate Manager. And I'm going to click the tab here for certificates. And then I'm going to click the plus option to add or sign. So we'll click on that. And then from the drop down menu, I'm going to select the option create a certificate signing request. Now, like a lot of computers out there, it can actually support multiple certificates. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm creating a certificate that's specifically for management of actual PFSense itself. So the name I'm going to give it is just management certificate. The key type, you've got a choice of RSA or ECDSA. And I'm just going to leave that on the default of RSA. For the bit length, the default is 2048, which is typically fine for web servers and so on. There's a bit of a trade-off here that if you use more bits, it does make it more secure. It's harder to break. The only trouble is it needs more compute power to encrypt and decrypt. Now, because this isn't just a typical web server, it's actually a web service that's being used to manage the firewall, it's not going to get that many connections. So I'm quite happy to actually increase that up to 4096. For the curve, I'm just going to leave that as is. And I'm, I'm just going to stick with the, the default digest algorithm as well. But if you want, you can increase this. I mean, you can go from 256 to 384 bits, 512 bits. Uh, if, if you've actually got a system that doesn't support SHA-2, then there is an option there for SHA-1. But as they're warning here, really you don't want to be using SHA-1. That's something as like a last resort. It's better to upgrade your systems to support SHA-2, but the default setting there of SHA-256 is fine for me. Now, for the common name, I need to actually put in the name that my web browser is going to be using to actually connect to this actual firewall. So I've got my host name, and then we've got the actual domain name. So the host name is FW, because it's a firewall, and the domain name is templab.lan. So this is typically what you would put in if you've got a computer on the internet, or even if it's internal, it's, it's best to put the fully qualified domain name. This gets included within the certificate. So when the browser connects to the actual computer, this information is used in the actual connection for the web browser. And it's also in the actual certificate itself. So that's what the browser is using to check against. It's saying, well, you're trying to connect to, for example, fw.templab.lan. But if the certificate said firewall.templab.lan, it would refuse the connection, basically, because the host names weren't aligned. This is whatever you put into your web browser uh, URL has to match whatever you're putting here for the certificate. The rest of the information is just information really for the certificate authority to, to check you are who you say you are, that the computer is legitimate and so on. But also if any you know, users connecting wants to check out you know, information about that specific server, they'll get that from information here. So because it's internal, for me, it doesn't really matter so much, but I'll, I'll still put some details in. So I'll set the country code, which for me is GB for Great Britain. Uh, the state is, for me specifically, it's England. I don't really need to bother with the, the city, really. Uh, for the organization, I'm just going to put that as templab.lan, because that's what this is. Uh, it's actually just templab, that's what I've called it. Organizational unit, I don't even necessarily need to put that in, so I'm just going to leave that blank. Now, it's then ask, asking for details about the actual certificates attributes. In other words, what are you actually using this for? So we've got an option here for the certificate type. 
Now, this is actually a server certificate. It's not used by actual uh, clients, for example, users to sign email requests and so on. This is actually for the server itself. So I'm going to select server certificate. And then we've got this option here, which is for alternative names. So you've got choices of things like the FQDN, the IP address, the URI, email address, and so on. The default's fine because most of the time you're just going to connect through the FQDN. Once you've got these certificates all set up, you would connect through the fully qualified domain anyway. Now, this is very important specifically for the Google Chrome web browser because it does check this um, out. It wants to know this information. Even if you don't actually have an alternative name, it still needs to see one within the actual certificate. So what I'm going to do is just to make my life easier. I'm going to copy that in, paste that into there. What you can do is you can add additional options. So for example, I could have added in like an IP address if I was going to connect via the IP address. But the problem with IP addresses is if they change, you've got to then rebuild your actual certificate and so on. So it's easier just to stick with the with your host names. So we've got all our information filled in there. So the next thing to do is just click on save. And then that actually creates our actual certificates, you know, our signed um, our certificate signing request that we need to then send off to the actual certificate authority. Now, although we've created a certificate signing request, it's not actually doing anything. I mean, it's not the actual certificate. It's just a request for a signed certificate. So as you can see here on PFSense, I've got a, an actual self-signed certificate that PFSense is using. And then I've got my certificate request down here at the bottom. So what I've got to do is I've actually got to get this over to the certificate authority. In the case of PFSense, it's actually really easy. Uh, if you just hover over this little exit icon here, it'll pop up and say export request. So if you click on that, it then actually downloads it in the case of Firefox. It, it downloads it immediately into your uh, downloads folder. So if I go over to the actual download folder on this computer, I'll click on that, it would help. Go to downloads. Now I've now got a file. So it's really just a matter of getting this across to your certificate authority. And they'll, they'll be able to then use that to create your actual signed certificate. Well, now that we've got our certificate created, we need to update PFSense so that instead of using this self-signed certificate here, it's going to use our signed certificate. Now, to do that, we actually need to update the actual certificate signing request. So where it's got the little pencil there, and it's got, if you hover over that, it says update CSR. So we'll click on that. And then it's asking us to basically paste in the actual certificate uh, data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my Explorer here. And I'm going to open this up with text editor. And what I need to do is copy this information, all of that. And then paste it into the window here. So paste that into there. So. You can see that's got information like begin certificate request up there, for instance. Uh, on this one, it's actually begin certificate and then it's end certificate. So we then click on update. And it's actually got the actual certificate. So this has now gone from being a certificate signing request to an actual genuine certificate. But at this moment in time, we're still using a self-signed certificate. We haven't actually got the actual PFSense firewall itself using the certificate. So that's what we need to do next. Now, although we've given PFSense a signed certificate from a certificate authority that we trust, it's still using its own self-signed certificate. So we need to actually update PFSense to use the new certificate going forward. So to do that, we're going to click on System and then Advanced. And then here where it's got SSL slash TLS certificate, we'll click on the drop down menu and we'll select that certificate that we've just created. And then I'm going to scroll down. Now here we've got a, a field called alternate host names. And I would suggest you actually fill that in. So in my case, the alternate name is fw.templab.lan. It matches the normal common name that we've got up here. So I'm connecting in through my web browser as fw.templab.lan. When I actually set this up, when I set up the certificate request, 
I wasn't particularly looking for an alternate name. It's just something that's a requirement for Google Chrome uh, browsers. So that was set to fw.templab.lan as well. And the certificate is now carrying the common name of fw.templab.lan and this alternate name of fw.templab.lan. The reason I put that in is because if this field's empty, what I've found is that you might connect in with your web browser. So you point it to the FQDN, you'll connect to the actual DN, um, to the PFSense server, and it thinks it's, it's undergone some sort of DNS rebinding attack, and it just refuses to let you connect. Now you can get around that by using the actual IP address of the firewall instead. Uh, you don't have that problem then because there's no fully qualified domain name, there's no potential DNS issue going on. But it's easier just to put the actual FQDN in here in the first place and it avoids that whole problem. So now that I've uh, done that, I'm going to click on the save button. So that updates PFSense. And what it'll do is it'll go off and update its own little web server and it'll start using that certificate going forward. Now this particular web browser I use to actually set that all up it doesn't trust the certificate authority I've got. So I'm going to have to swap over to a different browser. And then what we'll do is we'll actually test that this certificate's now working. Well, I've now connected in to PFSense using my Brave browser because this one trusts the CA that signed this actual certificate. And as you can see, we've now got a closed padlock. In other words, the web browser trusts the certificate because it trusts the CA. And as far as it's concerned, we are connected to the genuine fw.templab.lan. Now, in comparison, if I go over to my Zen Orchestra computer, I've still got this running with a self-signed certificate for now, but it does stand out when you compare the two. If I get into this habit of connecting to uh, computers that have only got a certificate that my web browser trusts, something like this is going to stand out immediately. So even though this is an internal server, it's better to have all of your internal servers using certificates that you trust. It's not a good idea really to be accepting these self-site certificates because it's less obvious to spot a man in the middle attack or a redirect to some website that's got malware on it. On the other hand, if all you ever accept are these secure connections like this, you're going to know straight away something's up if all of a sudden you see that. So it makes the whole security experience a lot better. Uh, even, as I say, even though these are internal computers, you're going to get into this habit of only accepting secure connections. And if something were to happen to a computer on the internet, it's going to stand out a lot more uh, to you by you know, going through this particular practice. But anyway, we've now got a secure connection to our firewall. So hopefully, as you've seen, it's pretty easy to do. You just set up the CR, uh, CSR. Once you've got that file, you'll give it to your certificate authority to sign and create your actual certificate, import that certificate into, a, into PFSense and assign it to the actual firewall. And then going forward, as long as your browser trusts the certificate, then you've got a secure connection going forward. Now, as far as the video is concerned, that's basically it. That's as far as I really need to go. But if you are interested in knowing how I actually signed the certificate for PFSense using OpenSSL, you can carry on to the next section. Otherwise, that's it. Thanks for watching. Now, if you've created your own certificate authority server, like I covered in a previous video, you can actually create and sign your own certificates for PFSense. So in this case, I'm actually logged into my root CA. I don't have any intermediary certificate authorities. The network's not really big enough to justify it for me. But I've logged in as the actual user that manages the certificates. And what I've done is to upload that certificate request to the actual uh, folder. If we look in the CSR folder, uh, it's a file called management plus certificate. And that's basically it's because I put a space in between the wording when I actually gave it a name. But what I need to do is before I go any further is I just want to double check that this does actually contain a subject alternative name. So I'm, I'm using OpenSSL to basically read that file. It then outputs it to text, but it then sends it over to grep and it's going to do a search for subject alt, and then it's going to give me an extra line after that. So when I hit return, you can see it's coming back. So it does include fw.templab.lan as a subject alternative name. The only trouble is OpenSSL doesn't carry that forward into the actual certificate itself. We've actually got to create an extension file that we feed into OpenSSL 
to get that information carried across essentially. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy an existing file that I've got. And I'm just gonna edit that specifically uh, for PF Sense so that I can use that when I actually have to sign the certificate. So in this case, I want 4096 for the bit length. And I need to change the common name to FW. My subject alternative name will be FW. I'm not going to be using any IP addressing here. So I'll take that out. And I'll save that. So I've now got a configuration file that I can actually reference. And then that way I can actually create a certificate that does create this subject alternative name. So I'm going to then run a, an actual command to create and sign that certificate. So I'll paste that in. So I'm referencing it over to the root CA config file, as well as the actual certificate request that we've uploaded there. What I'm going to do is get that to output that into my certs folder to create a new certificate for PFSense but I'm also going to get it to reference the extensions file that we've just created so we can get the subject alternative name. So I'll hit return. It wants to know what the actual key is because I've got a key on this private, uh, I've got a password on this private key. So I'm just going to hit return. Uh, do I want to sign that? So let's double check. Uh, we've got a country, states, organization. So the FQDN or common name as it's called, it, is fw.templab.land, that's what we want. The subject alternative name, fw.templab.land. So yep, that's good. So I'll say yes to sign that certificate. You can see this one, I've got mine set up to be valid for one year basically, which is fine. So I'm gonna say yes to that. And we now need to commit that to the database. So I'll say yes to that. And then if I have a look in my, let's see it's the certs folder. I've now got a certificate file specifically for PFSense. So what I need to do now is just get that over to uh, the PFSense server. And then I'd then be able to use that as I showed earlier to actually assign that to my actual PFSense firewall going forward. Well, thanks for making it to the end of this video. I really do hope you found it useful. If so, then do click the like button and share as that'll help get the video out to more people who might find it useful as well. If you've got any comments or suggestions, please post those in the comments section below. And if you're new to the channel and you'd like to see more content like this, then yes, do subscribe. Just remember to set the bell icon to actually send you notifications when new content gets released. Although I also post to Twitter as well as Facebook. If you'd like to help the channel and support it, you can actually make contributions through PayPal and buy me a coffee. I've also got links to Patreon and there's also the join membership option for YouTube itself. Patreon and YouTube members do have the option to actually benefit from early access as well. But above all, many thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.